Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato with my co-host, Scott Bernstein. Hey, how you doing, buddy? We have an exciting show on tap and one of uh, the most accomplished writers when it comes to chronicling the cartel world down in Mexico. Yeah, our, our guests today were super excited. And if I, if I mispronounce it correctly, but I think it's Yoan Grillo. Is that, am I pronouncing it? Uh, good enough, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> look, it's said all kinds of ways. So I don't really mind how it's said, but that's that's good enough for me. Okay, well, my last name is Bucciolato, and no one, so I have a Sicilian last name, Siciliano. Yeah. And people mispronounce yeah. it all the time. So I'm patient. I, I appreciate that. But um, he's a celebrated uh, journalist and author, as Scott points out. Uh, if you look at this guy's resume, I mean, Time Magazine, Associated Press, and two of his books that we want to talk about, and then a forthcoming book, but El Narco, Inside Mexico's Criminal Insurgency, is a book that I highly recommend. I use that a lot of the time in my Gangs and Organized Crime class. And then another text, uh, Gangster Warlords, a follow-up text, outstanding, uh, not just about Mexico, but what's going on in Central America, uh, the Caribbean, South America. Shower posse. So, yeah, yeah, the chapter on Jamaica is, is, is fascinating. So, yeah. and, then, and then he has a new book coming out, Blood, Gun Money, which we will also talk about. But uh, thank you for, for joining us. And um, you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in narco reporting? And then, and then we'll ask you some specific questions about, about the cartels and the, more, the, you know, the, the substance of your reporting. Yeah, sure. Great to be here, and, and hi to all the all the listeners, all the watchers. Uh, I'm originally from the UK. I uh, grew up in the UK. Uh, I came to Mexico uh, in the year 2000, so over 20 years ago now. Um, and I came here to do journalism uh, with the original idea of being here for a couple of years and moving on. It's been 20 years now. And I originally had ideas. You know, I didn't come to look at drug cartels. I was more interested in, uh, you know, or had uh, illusions, kind of fantasies about the ideas of uh, running around with guerrillas who were fighting military dictatorships and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I kind of looked at the civil wars back in the 80s, um, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala. Uh, but I came here and realized that chapter was kind of over and just fell into reporting on drugs and, and gangsters right away partly because I grew up in, in the UK in a city with a lot of drug use uh, around kind of an opioid epidemic back then in the 1980s and, and various uh, young guys, teenagers, young men I knew died of heroin overdoses back then. So I began reporting on these, these gangsters, crime, drugs, kind of fell into it. Uh, and then while I was reporting on this uh, over the years and I just man you know, managed to stay in Mexico, um, this situation blew up and, and the drug war really kicked off, uh, became like an armed conflict, comparable to an armed conflict. Now we've seen about maybe 200,000 deaths related to this. Uh, tens of thousands have disappeared. And so I, I, you know, I realized I couldn't write this only anymore and just news stories, began writing books about this uh, and then got a lot of reaction and just kept on getting a lot of uh, people interested in this subject. So it's been 20 years uh, looking at the drug cartel, violence in Mexico, and then going around Latin America, looking at the United States, trying to follow up this crime issue, which I think is one of the most important issues um, of our time. Yeah, I, I mean, that's definitely something uh, I want to talk about, too, because I, I know you mentioned that initially the, the political angle interests you, but if you read these these books, um, you, you actually go into that a lot, this sort of political context, yeah. which I know I'm interested in as a not only criminologist, but uh, a background in political science. Um, so even though the, the shift is to is to drug cartels, there's absolutely a political context going on. I mean, would you would you say that there are pretty distinct parallels between what you came there to do and what you actually ended up doing? I mean, I, I can see from an outsider's perspective, there definitely seems to be some analogous relationship between the guerrillas and the narco terrorists. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, like, you know, you see that uh, if back in the 20th century, the late 20th century, you had uh, in the mid to late 20th century, you had these civil wars breaking out and you had these strong guerrilla movements in a bunch of these countries. Then now you've got these gangster warlords, these criminals who are involved in these weird armed conflicts. Uh, I mean, not weird in a good way, but weird in that they're very hard to understand. 
and you haven't got clear battle lines. Um, but sure, you see all the time, you can see even, um, sometimes you can see direct lines between these different groups. Uh, in the case of Jamaica, the case of Brazil, you can see those. For example, one of the big drug trafficking organizations in Brazil called the Red Commando uh, began in a prison where gangsters like bank robbers at the time were locked up with political prisoners. And the regime, the military dictatorship at the time, thought, well, we're going to put in these, uh, these bank, we're going to put in the political prisoners, you know, the lefty guerrillas, uh, we'll put them in with the bank robbers and they're going to beat the crap out of them. Um, and that will demoralize them. But the opposite happened. You start seeing the bank robbers saying, oh, that's kind of interesting. We like this organization. Yeah, we can kind of take this organization and bring it to us. So that was one, that was kind of the birth of the Red Commando, which then really blew up in Brazil and other commandos followed them. So that's why you see in these Brazilian commandos this weird uh, political style language mixed up with this criminal language. Uh, the, the, the shower posse in Jamaica, or the posses in Jamaica is another story there. They began as politicized street gangs uh, in these ghetto areas. I mean, in, in Jamaica, they call them ghetto areas or garrison communities. They're called garrison communities because they're actually walled off. They're like garrisons, like fortresses, with only one way in and one way out. And you had, these were created as political voting bases. So the strong men, the dons of these areas, sometimes women as well rising up in these organizations, but a lot of strong men with these dons, uh, with these names like Jim Brown is one of the old ones, uh, uh, influenced by the American football player, the US American football player. Um, there were political organizations controlled or allied to political parties, stopping opposition parties coming in, so delivering the base of votes in these areas. And then they got into drug trafficking, came to the US and got into drug trafficking. So you can see these very, very specific links there. Then also, I mean, if you look in Mexico, which didn't have such a large guerrilla movement as many parts of Latin America in Mexico, uh, for various reasons, uh, it, Mexico would... Um, repress its own, the guerrilla groups in Mexico, but also would allow uh, political refugees from other places. And, but the drug cartels, the cartel, the crime cartels, have, have you know, so many more guns, so much more damage than any guerrilla group did here um, in, in many, many decades. Um, so what they've done in terms of confronting the military, um, taking territories has been, has been comparable to some levels of guerrilla fighting. Yeah, let me ask you about uh, Mexico, specifically this case study. For, for you know, I admit I'm not an, an expert on the cartel, so your book, El Narco, it was very helpful in uh, sketching out to me, like, who, who the main players are. So for, for our audience members and for myself, who are, who are less familiar with what's going on in Mexico, can you identify some of, like, the major cartels there? Because, like, we think of, like, the Italian mafia here, you've got five families in New York. How does it work in Mexico? I think most of us are probably familiar with the Sinaloa cartel, but but you talk about five or six major organizations in your text. If you could outline that for us, and then, and then we'll eventually update it in terms of what's going on now. But what were like the major organizations when you were writing El Narco? Yeah, so so this is a history, you know, a century in the making, over a century now. Uh, if you if you look at the time that uh, the United States. Um, restricted opium and cocaine in the Harrison's Narcotics Tax Act, which came into effect in 1915, was passed in 1914. Then right from then, you started seeing opium being smuggled from Mexico into the United States. Right back then with its origins in Chinese communities on both sides of the borders. So you had a Chinese community in Sinaloa, Mexico, Chinese communities in California, and they were bringing opium uh, over there, working with cor corrupt politicians in the, in, the, in the 1910s. But over the, you know, a long time, you saw the emergence of cartels, and this was kind of, in some ways, an organic thing gradually formed that gradually came together over time. Now, the concept of cartel came from Colombia, and the, the Medellin cartel was the first cartel we talk about um, in the early 1980s. It's not totally clear, even if that original name of cartel was how the cocaine traffickers called themselves, 
And in that, back in those days, there was a lot of talk around about OPEC, about the uh, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And they were like a, a petroleum cartel. So it was like petroleum cartel will have a cocaine cartel, the idea of kind of power. Or even if it was something which was done by the agents or encouraged by the Drug Enforcement Administration when they're making cases, because the way that drug law, laws are built in the United States, you want to have conspiracy cases. So you need organizations you can name and say, everyone a part of this, we, we, can, we, can, we can hammer. But anyway, this, this cartel idea came to Mexico in the 1980s. And the first cartel they talked about in Mexico was the Guadalajara cartel. Again, this might have been baptized by the agents, by the DA agents looking at it. Uh, but then you saw this, this growth of various cartels. So then you had from the, the Guadalajara cartel, which is a city in the heart of Mexico, you saw the power more move to the border with the Tijuana cartel, um, the El Chapo faction of the Sinaloa cartel, the Juarez cartel, and the Gulf cartel. So you had four major groups there. Then you just saw this, this series of splintering we've seen then. So the Sinaloa cartel then broke into Beltran Labor cartel. The um, uh, Gulf cartel had the Setas break away. You had now force rising in the south, known as La Familia Michoacana, which then broke up with the Knights Templar and the Familia Michoacana. Then the Beltran Labor cartel splintered particularly into loads of groups. So as these were hammered by the Mexican security forces, by the United States, you see them breaking and splintering. So now you have got dozens and dozens of what I call cartelitos, like smaller cartels, or that name is also used in Colombia, which have a similar kind of structure and control of territory, but are much more localized, much smaller. And you have loads of these groups. I mean, Guerreros Unidos, Los Rojos, um, uh, Cartel Independiente de Acapulco. I mean, there are new names coming up all the time. Um, and you can go, you know, these territories can sometimes be only in, you know, a part of a state um, run by young guys with hundreds of guys with AK-47s following them. So that's part of why it's so violent, because you've got so many groups now competing. You still, you've still also got a very, very powerful group that's emerged called the Jalisco New Generation Cartel um, fighting. So you've got big, powerful cartels, medium level and small you know, alliances changing, people fighting over um, every inch of territory sometimes. Do you think there's a correlation between the U.S. and, and Mexican governments uh, hammering down the major bosses and then and then when those major bosses are incarcerated you start to see more fracturing more splintering is that is is there a correlation there yeah well, yeah without a doubt uh, that happened i mean the what's become known as the kingpin strategy uh, and if you look at the the you know the history of the united states dea was you know go after bigger and bigger targets um so el chapo was kind of the ultimate target and i think his trial was kind of a marking point in that mission, because it's hard to kind of beat that. But it was like, you know, go after the, the kingpins. You can't just get the bottom guys. You can't get the middle guys. Take down and cut off the head of the snake. And then, you know, when you do that, so like, you know, as, as a very concrete example, you have a guy called Arturo Beltran Leva, known as Barbas or Jefe Jefes. You know, he had a big beard, crazy guy, very, very powerful drug trafficker, as big as Chapo. He came from a village right next to where El Chapo's village. I've been, I've been up to the mountains where these guys are from. And you see El Chapo's village, a place called La Tuna, right next to it, a place called La Palma. And that's where Beltran Leva family are from, the whole bunch of brothers. So extremely powerful drug trafficker. He was killed on DEA intelligence. Um, they paid, this is what the head of the DEA at the time in Mexico City told me, they paid $5 million for the information leading to the, the, the property where he's going to be at. They paid $5 million. They gave the information to the Mexican Marines, who are like an elite U.S.-trained force. This is in Cuernavaca, a uh, city of Cuernavaca, a nice spa town. It used to be a nice town, uh, about an hour from Mexico City. So the Marines went in there, big firefight, killed this guy. Um, he had all these kind of crazy uh, San, uh, Santera uh, beads, these kind of um, uh, beads from this like, uh, Cuban-style religion. And then the Marines decorated his body with dollar bills. They like made it, you know, when they took photos, they kind of decorated his, his, his corpse. Um, and then there was a funeral for, for one of the Marines who was killed in the operation. And they gave him, a, you know, a hero's funeral. And then afterwards, the cartel in revenge went and murdered the family of that Marine at the wake. 
So they killed the mother, the brother, the sister, the aunt. You know, that, that was, you know, just, that was revenge. That, you know, that's how, that's the level. When that happened, that was like, you know, how, how, you know what are we dealing with here? But then Arturo Beltraneva, who controlled a huge amount of territory, he was knocked down. So then suddenly out of his empire, um, you suddenly had all of these groups emerging. This is when these groups like Guerreros Unidos emerged, Los Rojos. So suddenly these new groups emerged who were like super violent. And they were like run by these young guys who weren't as um, restrained, who were like you know, young lieutenants. So there's this one guy, a fragment of the fragment of the fragment, a guy called El Huero Palaya. Um, a young guy, was like, he was like 22 years old. Uh, and he was controlling this little part of Guerrero State uh, with like literally hundreds of kids following him. Now, some guys I know were, were following up on this and they were held up, some journalists were held up by his people. They had their vehicles taken, laptops, IDs taken. There's like 200 literally kids. There was kids as young as 10, 12 years old in this crowd on the road there. So it's kind of uh, fragmenting and, you know, it's like if you had the American army broken up and then the, the lieutenants, you know, underneath these kind of bloody lieutenants underneath fighting amongst themselves. I've done some writing on the... Beltran Leva murder or death in the firefighter or whatnot. I'm sure nowhere even close to as versed in this subject as our guest. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't some of the information about where he was come from a pretty notorious narco who was American born named El Barbie or La Barbie? Uh, very possibly. I mean, like the DA guy told me that he told me that they paid five million. He told me it was an American citizen. He didn't give a name. I reported this about some point in the last year. I got a tip from a DEA yeah. guy that that information had come from El Barbie. The guy in Texas, right? El Barbie, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, if they paid him $5 million, that's pretty, you know, because he was a pretty high-level criminal, if that was true. Um, I don't know if your DA guy said to you that he he was paid for the information. I mean, oh, they're, 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 I don't know. I didn't get I didn't get that part that that there was money yeah. exchange. I heard that that there was information that was provided by is it El Barbie or La Barbie? Uh, La Barbie. La Barbie. La Barbie. Yeah, yeah. And he had been at one point aligned with Arturo Beltran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, I mean that 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 kind of rumor has been floating around for some years that it was La Barbie who who gave this up. Now it might have been. But there was multiple things involved, like Lababi gave some information, and then somebody else gave the actual address, physical address of the house, mm -hmm. or maybe it was was Lababi. But there, there, there's a kind of um, but Lababi's story is fascinating. He's from Laredo, Texas. I knew one guy who went to high school with him there, and he said he was like a friendly jock, was how he described. He was a him. football star. Yeah, you see him. He's a he's a beefy guy, but he, sure. he was like a friendly. You know, he's, he's a charismatic, friendly guy. His story of exactly how he got involved with the cartels, I think he was like dealing weed around um, around Laredo. Brownsville, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Around that area. And he flipped over the border. Now he, from his statements, became, you know, was recruited. This was a time when Arturo Beltran Leva was fighting in that turf war in Nuevo Laredo. And this is where a lot of my reporting, um, Back then, this is we're talking about the 2004, 2005 time. I was reporting very intensely from that area at the time. So I, this is when the, the 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 kind of turf war happened. That I believe is the real beginning of the current Mexican drug war. You had this fighting in Nuevo Laredo between the Gulf Cartel Setas and the Sinaloa Cartel, which at the time was the faction Arturo Beltran Leva with El Chapo Guzman. Now, back then, you know, there was a, 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 a murder of five gang bangers, five gang members who the Sinaloa cartel had sent into the city and they were murdered and their bodies were piled up in this house. And there was a note there. I've still got the clipping, in fact, from that here. that said, Arturo Beltran Leva and Chapo Guzman Send us more pendejos like these so we can kill them. So that was like showing the turf war and the fact that Arturo Beltran Leva was, was the guy you know, involved in, the, in this thing. Now, according to whatever information that uh, Barbie then, around this time, recruited and, and 
um, started working with Arturo Beltran Leva and was kind of his, he that was like his mentor, his kind of padrino, his godfather into the organization. Then Barbie. Did he marry someone from that organization, like the daughter or the niece of someone in that organization? Yeah, yeah, possibly. I'm, I'm not totally sure of that. What I, what I do know is that Barbie then turned up in Acapulco um, when this, this turf war that began in Nuevo Laredo then bounced down to Acapulco. And he turned up there as one of the big players and then started carrying out some pretty brutal violence there in the name of the Beltran Labour Organization, the, the Sinaloa Cartel, but before they broke off. When he, there was, I mean, he gave this statement after he was arrested. He gave this kind of bullshit interrogation video. It was given in a time when, when he was kind of talking through this stuff and, and giving out the information. And he was saying then that, like, um, Arturo Beltran Lever had gone mad and he'd fallen out with him. And that was kind of clear that he'd been put into a corner. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the full, I think, I think um, La Barbie's full story is kind of waiting to be told probably by La Barbie himself. You know, he, he did commission a movie. You can find a movie um, online, a, a kind of low-budget narco film that's made about La Barbie, which he said he, he said in that the interview that he commissioned them to make a film about himself. So that, 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 that should be flipped I think there's a big Hollywood production pre, in pre-production, isn't it? Like, well, they're, I know they're developing one. Developing one? They called him La Barbie because his, he, he looked like a Barbie doll. He had blonde hair. Oh, yeah, I think I heard that yeah. before. Um, let, me, let me ask you, speaking of the political angle here, so you can see where these conspiracy theories develop, and you talk about that in both of your books, and maybe there's some truth to it, <laughs> that if DEA gives this intel to the Mexican Marines, they have to assume there's a real possibility that the target is going to be killed. <laughs> And not not arrested. That's why I said it murdered, not right. Yeah. So so this is where some of these conspiracy theories develop. Like you talk about the the groups that were aligned against El Chapo, that that like DEA, State Department, CIA, that they're basically in cahoots with El Chapo, either either tacitly or or um, some kind of grander conspiracy. What what are your thoughts on on that angle? I mean, I think you do mention that in your text a little bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. So so like. I mean, you know, conspiracy theories, and, and, and because the word conspiracy theory is kind of thrown around a lot now, it's even maybe conspiracy theories. Uh, I saw one person just be calling like conspiracy hypotheses, which you call them more, you know, like, uh, like, because sometimes these conspiracies are true. Uh, you know, they, they turn out to be, there, there really are conspiratorial people involved. And at the same time, sometimes there are things which are, um, you know, like exactly people exaggerate these things. So in terms of this, this, this bigger idea um, of the Sinaloa cartel being allied with the Mexican government and then the Sinaloa cartel being allied, allied with the CIA or drug traffickers being allied with the CIA. So in terms of the Mexican government, there's certainly, a, I mean, I think you know, beyond, these are, these are beyond theories. These, these are there's a lot of very, very proven um, information about the way the drug cartels have worked with the Mexican government apparatus for, for 100 years. Um, you know, if you go back to 1916, there was a, a governor of, of, of Baja California State there believed to be working with these very early groups of, of, of Chinese um, Mexicans taking uh, opium into the United States. And, you know, that was 1916. Now we go forward to 2021. We've got the former head of public security under Felipe Calderon, uh, General Garcia Luna, um, as the, um, who, is le- who was one of the kind of real architects, the core people involved in the crackdown on drug cartels in prison in the United States on drug trafficking charges, saying that he took bribes and, and he worked with drug cartels. So in terms of the Mexican government working with these guys or, or elements of the Mexican government, you know, that, we know that's for a fact. What is more complicated about this is that now the Mexican government or the Mexican government apparatus, state apparatus, is a many-headed beast. It's not like one, so, you know, one thing that is simply working with one cartel. You can have 
federal police working with one cartel and local police working with another. Um, this again has been shown um, there in Michoacán. You had a case where a bunch of the Michoacán cartel, the time La Familia Michoacana, uh, attacked and murdered loads of federal police officers. And then later on, you had one of the major cartel figures, a guy called Tyson, who came out in a confession and said that well, he was a former state police officer and that the state they were using state police cars to help with the attack. So the state police were working with the cartel against federal police. Back going to my coverage in Nuevo Laredo again back in 2004, 2005. In the year 2005, I was there. It was on a Saturday morning. I was trying to get out of there back to Mexico City. And then this shootout began between uh, federal police and lo local municipal police. So again, we have different, it's, it's kind of many headed beast and there's fights there breaking out. In terms of the CIA links or the corruption in the DEA, that's uh, uh, again, a more complicated thing. I think we can see there's issues. So there's issues if we go back to the 1980s, then there's the kind of Dark Alliance um, series. And, you know, the, 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 the whole stories around that. Gary, that Webb, elements Gary of Webb's that, reporting. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. The elements of that are true. And if you look at some of the CIA's own admission, then elements of this are true. But we have to really distinguish between what's true, what sometimes the enemies attacked it, misrepresenting what he was saying, he perhaps overplayed a bit in some of his reporting, some elements. So what is true, I think, is that you have back then CIA um, involved and supporting the war in Nicaragua. So their priority is we've got to defeat uh, or destabilize a socialist government in Nicaragua. That's our mission. And so we're going to support these guys, the Contras, a bunch of guys against the government with guns. I mean, counter, you know, right wing guerrillas, paramilitaries, counter revolutionaries based in Honduras. So then they're allying with drug traffickers to support them. And you see that, um, you know, that's, that's basically an admission there. Now it gets more complicated as to how that plays out exactly now with this in a lower cartel and all the, the kind of modern times. It's not, I think, I think it's quite as simple as this like very, very simple thing of the CIA working, but you can see levels of corruption. Now, with the DEA as well, you can see in their own practices, uh, unfortunately, if they get information from one cartel and you just take down another, then they're already you know, involved in certain suspect practices. And another interesting case study, uh, not, speak of, not only Nicaragua, but in uh, Colombia, um, we know that DEA and U.S. military were working with the right-wing paramilitaries <laughs> to try to take down Pablo. In, uh, in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> so there were some, some other sketchy uh, things going on with, with U.S. Uh, military law enforcement with, with uh, narco traffickers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean well, public, Pablo Escobar was in some ways the, I mean, the, the, a lot of the drug traffickers in Medellin are very right wing. Yeah. Um, their politics are very right wing and very paramilitary. Um, and the, the FARC were, you know, the, the, the Revolutionary Armed Forces Colombia were the left wing guerrillas. So a lot of the drug traffickers supported the paramilitaries and the paramilitaries got into drug trafficking. And then you've got basically these, they were like paramilitary drug traffickers. So when you had a civil war there, but also the FARC were also involved in drug trafficking. So you had the regular narcos, the paramilitary drug tra traffickers and the left-wing guerrilla drug traffickers. And they're all murdering a bunch of people. And then into these, you know, cauldrons of violence, the U.S. is involved and 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 you know and all these different forces are involved. So these are very messy situations. And I mean, absolutely. I mean, there's uh, you get involved. There, there, there's some you know dark alliances, as the as the series uh, is called. Yeah, uh, let's let's also segue into your your new book. And and let me give you um something I I found out when I was teaching in Arizona. Um, I was doing some field research in San Diego with um, San Diego PD, the gang unit, but also some of the military police with the U.S. Navy. And uh, they had a real concern about gang members in the military there down in San Diego and specifically outlaw mm. bikers. And mm. there were some concerns that, that outlaw bikers were stealing weapons from the arsenal. And you're right in San Diego, right? You're right by TJ 
the <laughs> Tijuana and and selling selling weapons to to the uh, um, cartels uh, south of the border. So I, I always thought that that was an interesting uh, you know um, situation going on. So so talk to us, walk us through that. I know, and it seems like the emphasis of your new book is going to be about right. We 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 know the drugs are coming north, but there's weapons going south. So let, let's talk about that. Absolutely, yeah. So my new book, uh, Blood Gun Money. How America Arms Gangs and Cartels is about the, the gun black market, the firearms black market within the United States and how it goes into Mexico, Central America, across the hemisphere, and in fact, across the world. You know, you see these guns from the, the retail, from the black market in the United States, turning up in the Philippines, turning up, you know, like a long way away. Uh, now, this links to this. Now, I got into looking at the gun black, the firearms black market, but it's completely entwined with the drug black market. So, you know, you see this at every level. Um, if you go, if you look at these, you know, in Baltimore, I went, I have a chapter from Baltimore, Maryland in this and talk to the, the gun traffickers there, the gun people selling guns in the corner and a lot of them, they're exchanging guns and drugs and selling guns to drug dealers. You see El Chapo and the Sinaloa cartel, this came out of the trial, they're moving guns south by the thousands, by the tens of thousands, you know, the guns are going south. You see this again with the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia and the movement of weapons, but also they're involved in cocaine. So drugs and guns are linked together. Uh, you know, it's entangled. Now, this gun trafficking So you see you have in the United States a legal firearms market, retail market, and more guns in civilian hands than the next 25 countries combined. The last count estimated 393 million, likely over 400 million now. But you also have, you know, within this, this massive amount of black market firearms. So most of the guns being used in killing, really in the United States, in homicides, are, are, are illegal because most of the people use it. A lot of people are felons, are drug dealers who have these guns. So you see this uh, black gun, black market, and then this just flows down to Mexico, this trafficking down to Mexico. Biker gangs are players, as you say. Uh, but also all kind of players there. And um, the estimates, you know, there's been traced in the last 12 years, 164,000 weapons taken from criminals here and traced direct to the United States. But the estimates are like in the last 10 years, been like more than 2 million. What about, do you talk about the um, examples of just going to gun and knife shows and making legal purchases, like straw man purchases, is, would you say that's still a major problem with this uh, situation? Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's basically four main ways that guns go into the black market. And the first way is the private sale loophole. So it can be at gun shows or other private sales. But if it's a private sale, then it could be uh, somebody who's a, who's a criminal, who's a gangster, and they are um, going no ID buying the guns. And I went to I interviewed a, a gun trafficker in Ciudad Juarez in the prison who was in prison for federal gun trafficking charges. And he was doing this. He was going to the U.S., buying these guns in the black market and taking them to, to Mexico. But the, another bigger way probably is straw purchasing, meaning you pay somebody who hasn't got a criminal record. You pay them to go and buy guns. And it's offered as little as $100 a gun, um, even less because the, the, the punishments are very low on this. They'll often only get probation. But these people are going in, sometimes buying uh, you know, half a million dollars worth of you know, guns and so forth. Now, uh, what a lot of the, uh, some people who, are, who know this would also immediately jump out and talk about, talk about a case called Fast and Furious, right. um, if you're aware of that case. Yep. So you're obviously also then again, you have more conspiratorial things there, where the, the idea they were letting the the feds knew that those guns were walking they 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 were allowing this to happen so that they could trace the weapons right but then they didn't but, but then they lost they lost track of them and then some bad things happened as a result of that yeah absolutely so you had uh the ATF with a with a sting operation under Barack Obama in in 2009 to 2010 um a big sting operation the idea they would build up a big conspiracy case again go after kingpins and they let 2,000, close to 2,000 guns walk into Mexico. Uh, um, in one case, they, they were used by a bunch of criminals who shot dead a Border Patrol agent from the elite Bortak unit. They shot him dead. 
Uh, and that's when this kind of story broke. And that was a big scandal as well. So they get that gets back into a lot of these conspiracies about, you know, people see that in like, you know, America, Mexican government working with the cartels, even giving them guns. Uh, and that, you know, ruffles a lot of feathers. So when you talk about who's behind the, the weapons trafficking, in some cases, they're straw man purchases and maybe just some like independent arms trafficker. But we did mention that the outlaw bikers, are there any specific organizations you've ident- identified as being heavily involved in weapons trafficking, like a, like a criminal organized crime organization or a gang? Or is this usually like freelance arms traffickers or is it both? Uh, it's both, but like in the trafficking into Mexico, so the cartels control and oversee basically all the trafficking that's happening into Mexico and out of Mexico. So if you look at the, the profile of a couple of different people involved in this gun trafficking into Mexico I talked to, they were all cartel related or affiliated in some way. So there was one, uh, you know, this one thing was a group of them. You know, it was a group of three guys, one based in Dallas, a um, couple based in, in, in Chihuahua. Um, but they would pay off the cartel money for permission to do the trafficking, and they would be selling to the cartel um, gunmen and affiliates. Uh, another guy I interviewed and profiled there was an American citizen who was involved in laying cable for fiber optics around the border area, and he was um, also being paid by a cartel, affiliated by a cartel, to, uh, to do this stuff. So, so the cartels. Now, you mentioned the outlaw bike gangs. They're also now the ATF really love to go after these guys. I've got also the book a profile of an ATF agent who went undercover in three biker gangs: the uh, the the warlocks, the um, Mongols, and the Bagos. Um, he did like big operations, uh, and so they've been involved in moving guns around for some time. Uh, but the ATF, the ATF have been hitting them very, very hard for various reasons the ATF have been really nailing the biker gangs. I think the Hells Angels have a pretty significant presence in in that gun running circuit or network. And I've heard the Mongols and I've heard the Banditos. Those are the three gangs that I've heard. Warlocks is more of a... That's Florida, isn't it? Yeah, Warlocks is more like east, southeast coast. So yeah, so the the guy did, uh, the guy, this ATF agent, our profile, uh, who's called Coz, he, uh, he infiltrated first the um, Vagos in Los Angeles. Oh, the Vagos. Yeah, the Vagos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vagos. Smaller yeah. case. Then he did the Warlocks, in, and he did it out of Virginia. And uh, basically, they, and it was a case that spiraled down to Florida because they began in Florida, but it was like Virginia, Florida, Maryland. Um, and they they quite a big case. Now, m- most of it, it was the ATF, but they weren't really doing them on gun trafficking um, related charges. It was more... Uh, felons with firearms, and then they just did, did them on drug charges. And then the Mongols, they went back and did the Mongols in um, in Los Angeles, and that was that was a big case. And the ATF agent himself, in this undercover work, himself got shot at, himself got his head bust open, uh, himself carried guns for gangsters. So he had a lot of crazy stories about that. The bikers are really out there, man. I mean, they're, I, you know, they're the fringe of the fringe. Of the underworld? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've gotten some exposure to them the last 10 years. And, you know, you're, you go into some of these clubhouses and, and you're at some of these parties and, it, and it's really like you're, you're like in, a, in, in the middle of a movie. And you're you're expecting you know, uh, you know barroom brawl, <laughs> you know, or you're expecting Peter Fonda or Dennis Hopper or Jack Nicholson from Easy Rider to pop out. Um, can we can we go backwards for a second? Um, we mentioned or you mentioned the new generation uh, Jalisco cartel, and so I guess I'm I'm asking you to either give me a, a yay or a nay. The U.S. government DEA ATF seems to be making the argument, at least to the press, I've heard this from a number of my sources in, in federal law enforcement, that El Mencho is the new El Chapo. Um, El Mencho is the boss of the, of the new, new generation Jalisco um, cartel. I've done a little bit of reporting this last year about how one of their, and just so the audience knows, El Mencho is, like El Chapo, is on the run, um, has been on the run for for quite a while. Unlike El Chapo, and again, please step in and tell me if I'm 
misstating any of these facts because, again, you are the expert. Uh, El Mencho cut his teeth in the underworld in California, I believe in northern, northern California, did prison time uh, in the California Department of Corrections, I believe, and then eventually migrated uh, south and, and got hooked up in, in, in the cartel uh, world. One of the ways that they are strategizing, so I guess this is a multi-pronged question, so give me a yay or nay and then expand on what I'm saying. Uh, one, one of the, the interesting uh, strategies to me uh, in terms of uh, law enforcement looking to, or American law enforcement looking to catch El Mencho the way they, ca- uh, they caught El Chapo was that they're squeezing his kids. They've, uh, they have both his son and his daughter who were running big parts of his operation on the streets locked up in American prisons right now um, awaiting trial. Uh, and they actually nailed the daughter coming to a court hearing for her brother, El Mencho's son, who they call El, Men- El Menchito, or the little baby Mencho. His, da- his kids are... American they're, they're, citizens, aren't they? Or no? I don't, I don't know. know. Maybe Yohan can. So, can you expand in. a little bit on um, El Mencho and whether or not yeah, it, yeah, is, yeah, is sure, it propaganda sure. that he's the new El Chapo, or is he really the new El Chapo? Well, uh, like, like I think with with the whole Chapo phenomenon, uh, then El Chapo became the most notorious uh, Mexican cartel leader of ever, mm-hmm. uh, and I would say you've had three of the most notorious gangsters in the last century have been El Chapo, Pablo Escobar, and Al Capone. Mm -hmm. They're the the three big names. And no, I know the name recognition on them goes beyond anything else. So, but but really El Chapo, so El Chapo's infamy didn't necessarily mean that he was, was the most powerful gangster in Mexico and necessarily the richest. He just had this level of notoriety and infamy that was so big. Now, part of that was escaping to federal prisons. Uh, part of it was the songs about him that was created through the whole narco culture. And he was part of the Sinaloa cartel, a very, very powerful cartel. Uh, so I, I think some of it can be the name has a ring, El, you know, Chapo Guzman. It has, you know, El Chapo has this kind of ring that really catches on. And then the journalists themselves, and then the meeting with Sean Penn, it all adds up and adds up. Yeah, the mythology feeds so, on itself. Exactly. It became like a bigger, like a whirlpool, a bigger and bigger thing, which then eventually got to the trial. And then they created a three month trial with 56 or 54 witnesses. Um, and they really you know, went to show. Now, from the point of view of the DEA, that was like the accumulation of this kingpin strategy. But once you take down El Chapo, where can you go from there? You can't create the same. So the Asians want to make names for themselves. They want to become the, the guy who got El Chapo. But you can't really beat that. I think one of the reasons they started now going after the political protection, the, the, the generals, the, is like, we've done the biggest drug trafficker. Now we have to go after politicians to get kind of uh, these, these things. Now, but in terms of being a gangster warlord, El Mencho is undoubtedly uh, a seriously powerful gangster warlord. Now, I, I mean, he he has got got an, a name for very violent paramilitary style actions. So El Chapo managed to have a reputation of being one of the better bad guys. So El Chapo's not as you know, I'm not as violent or predatory in his criminal activity as the Setas or some of the other people. Uh, El Mencho has a reputation and his people have a reputation of hitting back hard and they're kind of making these videos. There's a famous video which came out last year, which you probably have seen, with all of these guys in in camo gear with these guns and these heavily armoured cars going, uh, and there's like all of these guys and there's like, I mean, like huge amounts of this. I mean, it was a crazy, you know, it really had an impact, this this video. So like making videos, these propaganda videos of showing heavily, heavily paramilitarized people, but also in terms of actions. So the attempts to capture him, there were several attempts, and he launched his uh, his men to blockade the state of Jalisco. So you had this one attempt on May 1st, 2015, 
in which there were more than 40 blockades. And I mean blockades, they would hijack trucks, burn trucks over the road um, and to stop any military movement. And in that same situation, they fired on a military helicopter, uh, supposedly with an RPG-7, and shot down the military helicopter with an RPG-7. So really kind of this, uh, and then you, you see the uh, getting back to the guns, uh, it's the Hillisco New Generation Cartel have been assembling their own AR-15s, buying bulk parts in the United States, bringing them down to Mexico and assembling them in, in, in little workshop, little factory workshops down here. Um, they've seen weaponized drones uh, linked to the Hillisco Cartel. Now, there are rumors, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, there are rumors that he's dead um, and that it's now like a ghost of him living on with this thing. There's talking about kind of different power groups within the cartel. They were recently linked to the the attack on the the on the former governor, uh, assassination of the former governor um, uh, of of Jalisco, um, Sandoval, uh, in in the state. So you have, um, yeah, I mean they're they're big players and they're they're turning up. They're turning up everywhere. Every state you seem to go to in Mexico, there seems to be signs of the Jalisco New Generation Cartel. Uh, now, if the DA will be able to take them down, I mean, I think it depends a lot on the Mexican government now. There's a lot of tension now between Mexican law enforcement and the Mexican government and the United States law enforcement. Have, have we ever seen a situation, or at least in your reporting, um, where the U.S. government has tried to squeeze a narco's family? I mean, I can't remember El Chapo's kids being locked up in U.S. federal prisons or Pablo's kids being locked up in... That seems um, to me like that's somewhat of pa a... Pablo's a, a, family, they stopped in Germany. Remember, they 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 wouldn't let them get on the plane right. back to Colombia. I remember. That. Um, I, I think it's um, not that out there. I'm trying to think of some cases. Uh, in Mexico, certainly, I mean, you know, these two talks to the agents, they say, like, you know, look at the families, trace the families. That's how you can try and find them. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the things they say. I'm trying to think of some specific cases where the United States has tried to use that as leverage uh, in some of the older cases uh, of some of their, um, I mean, certainly going after their people close to them and trying to get them to flip on them. Um, but yeah, no, no cases there spring to mind, spring to mind, but... Um, I mean, to me, it's really like you're you're already after this very dangerous, you know, crime lord, drug lord, warlord that has a reputation for extreme violence, and then it seems like by uh, locking up his his beloved daughter and son who are doing a lot of his bidding, it's almost like sticking your your whole fist into the hornet's nest. I mean, th thinking on it, they they have got I me mean, like because a lot of so much of these drug cartels are fa a lot of family operations and family orientated because you know they trust so you think about how they went after the tijuana cartel it was going after family member family member um with el chapo there was like taking down of various family members of el chapo they've got they've got various family members of el mayo um so you have el mayo's son el mayo's brother in prison in the united states and then in fact they witnessed against el chapo um el maito and el maito uh, the son of El Mayo was one of the, he originally, his defense originally was actually using the conspiracy theory we talked about earlier of saying, well, actually the, the U.S. government supported the Sinaloa cartel. So what I was doing was sanctioned drug trafficking. That was his defense originally. I, 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 I covered some of the Chapo trial, and uh, it, which was crazy stuff. It was movie stuff, as you say, talking earlier. And the lawyers said they originally tried to have the defense, um, it has a technical lawyer name for it, the uh, authority defense saying the original defense of El Chapo was going to try and be, well, the U.S. government supported the Sinaloa cartel. Um, and the uh, U.S. Uh, attorneys knocked that out. They were like, you know, we're not going to allow this happening in, a US, in, in this court. We're going to run this show. Uh, let me ask you about the uh, the actual drugs themselves. Um, my understanding is that the the demand in the United States for fentanyl is so large right now that actually, like the the 
the farmers that, that farm opium and marijuana and coca leaves are worried about this, that there could be some real economic problems because those, those drugs are not in his, the old school drugs, heroin, marijuana, cocaine, are, are not in as much demand as opposed to the fentanyl, which we know a lot of that is coming from the cartels too. Any, any insight in, into that? Is that like the, this kind of the economics of it? Yeah, sure. I mean, you see the uh, different the market moving around over the years. So, marijuana was a big cash crop for the cartels for many years. Um, as marijuana was legalized in the United States, then you had um, sorry, sorry, I, I have a dog here, and when there's there's musicians who play on the street, <laughs> it's quite all right. He starts howling. <laughs> he starts howling, like singing with this, like he, he, he likes this certain music and he starts howling with the music. <laughs> I can hear my dog, my dog howling in the background now. I'm just coming in, a, my headphones on, so it's pretty not. Mood music. Through. Yeah, uh, that's quite all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, 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 when I go and make fun of him, he gets embarrassed when I make fun of him. We won't do it, but like, as I'm not there right now, he's, he's howling away. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, so you see these, uh, like marijuana was a big cash crop for a lot of years. You had the, the legalization in, the, in parts of the U.S., so you saw this massive collapse of, of Mexican marijuana. Now, you still see today marijuana going over the border, and you still see marijuana being grown in Sinaloa and in Guerrero and in Michoacan, and that money going to the gangsters is kind of frustrating. I thought we'd just get marijuana out of the way now and say, just legalize the thing now. We've got it half legal anyway, and then take that out of the hands of the cartels. But there's still marijuana money being made, but it kind of saw a dive. So after the dive of marijuana, that coincided with a big up to uptick in opioid addictions. So then it was like heroin, 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 heroin prices are going up. Everyone getting to, go, getting to growing opium to make heroin. So it was a big boom in the heroin. Now, again, it's hard to figure out these markets. You have a mix of supply and demand in this. You know, you have like people wanting more heroin, so they bring in more heroin, then it reaches a level where they can't get any more. Um, you can't, you know, they're not going to take anymore. They're, they're taking so much already. So then you have this big boom and everyone making heroin and then they're kind of oversupply. So then you sort of dive in the opium prices. Now, also with the fentanyl coming in, what happens actually a lot of the time you see them making heroin here, they're pumping the heroin with fentanyl. So it's heroin laced with fentanyl. And you talk to heroin users in the United States or in various places, they want, they want heroin with an extra kick. Heroin laced with fentanyl is the thing. Um, but because also, you know, fentanyl and, and like these synthetic drugs, the same as crystal meth, they're very, very cheap overheads. You can make them anywhere um, in terms of you don't have to only make them in a traditional drug producing area where you have to grow crops. You can just make them in, in labs anywhere. So you get these labs all over Mexico um, and you can start banging out fentanyl or ex importing fentanyl from China. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's a big one. Yeah. It's a big one, China. And 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 the crazy um you know mess in the United States. And it's sad. I mean, the, the level of deaths right now, overdose deaths in the United States is is devastating. Yeah, um, I, I know we're almost out of time, but um one thing that I also wanted to ask you, um Scott and I are very much interested in uh, you know, I teach courses on crime and film, crime and media, so Scott and I are both very much interested in the like pop how uh, representations of, of gangsters and the underworld in in popular culture, and one thing that's interesting in your in your book, you you talk about both uh, examples of Mexican uh, drug lords, but also in uh, Jamaica, and and how that they're infatuated with the Godfather movies, <laughs> and so uh, yeah. I just wonder if you could tell us about like some in, in your encounters, the guys you've interviewed, the guys you've researched. Um, how into are, are these? Do these guys watch these movies? Scarface, Goodfellas, The Godfather, and, and like, what's their takeaway? Yeah, sure. So you get a weird interaction between fact and fantasy, and these things going around. So you have The Godfather. Um, you know, in, so in Jamaica, they were saying they were like they everyone loved The Godfather. Um, that the name they have dons for the Jamaican. Uh, Posse leaders came from the gods. Because so I said, you know, when did you start calling them dons? He said, I was about around about the time the Godfather came out. <laughs> you know, it was like Don Corleone, and suddenly it was like, you know, do, the, the Don, and it becomes uh, Dada's Coke, the Don of the Shower Posse. So they, they have this influence there. 
uh, I mean, Scarface. I went into one prison in, in Nuevo Laredo where the, this drug boss in the prison, they, he was like running crazy stuff in the prison. He had a pool table, a disco sound system inside the prison, and they went in and took it out. And he had a massive life-size photo of Al Pacino from Scarface. <laughs> and I put, it, put all this stuff out of the prison. Now, um, in, 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 uh, in, in Honduras, I said, like, down there, like, when the, the, the gangs become more aggressive, and they said, well, that was after the film Blood In, Blood Out. Oh, yeah. Um, started being seen in Honduras. And they loved it. They, they called it Batos Locos. And there's a gang they, inspired by the film, a gang called Batas Locos, which is still around, in fact, today, and they still control territory. And they said before that film came out, they were like... Um, more like dressed like the guys in the Michael Jackson bad video. <laughs> and, and then after blood in, blood out, they were like, oh, good cholos and all the whole thing. So you get this weird mix um, of, of fantasy and fiction. I mean, I talked to Pablo Escobar's son uh, about, did he watch the, 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 the TV series about his father? He said he, he said he watched every one. He watched all these series. He said, they're all, they're all wrong. I want to make my own one, which is right. Um, you know, you saw El Chapo watching the series the Queen of the South and becoming infatuated with the actress, Kate Castillo, which then led to the whole Sean Penn encounter. So absolutely, I mean, um, the gangsters are watching these TV series um, and you get a weird mix where this kind of stuff is like fantasy playing out. Um, but what you don't see, I think, is the real pain mm -hmm. um, in the TV series and, and maybe the, the gangsters themselves like to forget about that side as well, kind of hide that side. Is it art imitating life or is it life imitating art? That age old question when, when it comes to this kind of stuff. Yeah, I think it's an interaction. I think there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a double play there, both sides. But then like, but if you, you know, I was, I was thinking before, if you really wanted to make a, a more realistic TV series about this or film, um, it's going to be more like the killing fields right. um, than, you know, the, the, the noise, you know, Scarface. So like you see these things like a mass grave, uh, there's a mass grave of 250 corpses in uh, the state of Veracruz, and I've been to the place in a cow field, and this is backed up to a, a wood where a, a, a regular housing area of, like, middle-class housing. Um, and as they were digging up these mass, uh, these corpses, the family were, like, smelling um, the smell of death. Um, you know, I interviewed one of the mothers searching for her son um, for years. Um, it took six years of searching for her son before his body was identified in this mass grave. So, so absolutely, I mean, the, these kind of darkness of those kind of things, a lot of the drug traffickers or people involved in this you meet are not rich. They're actually a bunch of broke or working class guys. I mean, like, like it's yeah. like anything. I mean, you have, like the, like the Coca-Cola Corporation, I mean, you've got the guys at the top, and then you've got guys working in bottling plants. Yep. And, and in the drug trafficking industry, you've got loads and loads of guys who are doing a bunch of things, and they're not super rich. And you've got you know, a lot of these guys who are killers. I mean, now killers being paid $100 for murders. Um, I mean, what's that in 100 bucks? You kill somebody, kill somebody else, another 100 bucks. Um, people who are paid on salaries of things like, you know, 500 bucks a month. Um, some of these low-level guys. I mean, I tell people all the time that that's probably the biggest fallacy when it comes to um, real-life gangsterism and, you know, me being someone that has made my career as chronicling it. And I'm like, you know, the fallacy is that all these guys are, are Tony Montana. I mean, right. in reality, they're more like Workers. Le lefty from Donnie Brasco, who's taken a, <laughs> a hammer to a, a, a parking yeah. meter that the, the, the majority of the guys are spokes on a wheel that if they just worked a normal job, a nine to five job, they'd be making as much money as they are on the street. Yeah. Yeah. There's a class system. Let me ask one, um, one final question. You, you seem like, just based on a couple of references you made, a bit of a cinephile, you referenced Killing Fields, a great movie with Sam Watterson. You mentioned uh, Blood yeah. In, Blood Out, which is, I think, one of the more underrated yeah. gangster movies. When people talk about um, Mexican gangsters, they seem to always talk about American Me, which, by the way, I love. Yeah, that's a good movie, I too. love American Me. Yeah. But Blood In, Blood Out is kind of the, uh, a similar retelling of that same story, kind of taken from a, a little bit of a different angle. So, you know, based on the fact that you, you obviously watch a lot of movies or you, you seem to be well-versed on gangster movies, what would you say are the most accurate depictions of the stuff that, that you write about, the, the cartels and, and, and Mexican drug lords? Like, do, do you 
uh, I mean, the movie Traffic to me comes to mind, which I which I really enjoyed. Uh, Sicario. Or, or, uh, Sicario is amazing. What are the movies that uh, stand out most to you in, in that genre? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about doing a video, even of like the top ones, but you know, I have, I have a kind of mixed feelings because also I have a, um, you know, sometimes uh, you know, it seems like bad taste to be glorifying the films. Yeah. Especially when you when you spend time with like families and you know they're like you know these mothers who are like their son was dragged away by gunmen and you know mm-hmm. there's like people kind of sitting there eating popcorn with his stuff. Um but in terms of the movies, um first of all I think the Brazilian movies um are some of the best of the Americas, Latin America. Um I mean I, I love City of God. City of God, yeah. Um yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I was I was with I was in a years ago in a conference with the the writer who wrote the book it was based on, um, and he, he was an interesting he was an interesting character, uh, who was actually a guy who grew up in this neighborhood and kind of wrote that story. And um, but it was, I mean, the city of God I think's kind of now that shows certain kind of low level things, but it, it, I, I love the spirit of the movie. Now there's a very a couple of pretty um, in some ways controversial films out of Brazil. Um, you can find Elite Squad 1 and 2. And Elite Squad 1, um, called Squadron de Elite, I think it's how to pronounce it. In, in, or my, my Portuguese pronunciation is terrible. But um, the, uh, uh, that movie profiles these cops. Now, the first movie, when it came out, and it shows these cops, I mean, like plastic bags over these guys' heads, um, like real nasty stuff. I mean, really intense Barbella fighting. I mean, you've seen, you know, there was a Call of Duty warfare simulation of the favela fighting, and it was kind of looks pretty much how it looks in some of these favelas. You're in these kind of crazy alleys, and there's a bunch of these guys with guns. It's, I mean, the Brazilian stuff is out there to see because that's where you walk into these favelas, these these ghetto neighborhoods, and there's absolutely, um, you know, like crazy people with guns, people with grenade launchers, selling drugs openly, like really crazy stuff. But that, the first movie, uh, Elite Squad, shows the police. And first of all, the police criticized it. But actually, it became kind of a cult film. And some of the supporters of the right-wing Bolsonaro were kind of fans of this, this idea, this kind of desperado cops doing this kind of crazy war in these neighborhoods. Uh, now, other films from Mexico, you had uh, a while ago an interesting film called Sin Nombre, without na- without um, a name. Oh, it was a great new film. Um, I mean, it's kind of an art film um, in, to some extent, um, which is up for the Oscars, called Yano Stoy Aki, um, I'm No Longer Here. Um, and that is uh, based in Monterrey, flipped in Monterrey, New York. And that profiles Monterrey during some of the worst violence there. And it looks very, physically looks very realistic. I covered a lot of the violence there and it kind of brings it back. Um, in terms of some of the big American films on this, I don't, they don't really do it for me. I mean, the series Narcos is more realistic or more closer to some of this stuff. Uh, I guess some of the older, I just, yeah, again, Blood In, Blood, blood Out um, is, it, you know, is, 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 a, is a kind of touching movie. But it, maybe the great, great movie on this hasn't been made, but then maybe... It can't be made because maybe say maybe it has to be like too kind of dark, like the killing fields, which people don't really want to see in a cinema. No, I, even City of God, I I think is a difficult film to watch. I mean, I, I agree with you; it's well done. It's an important film, but it's, I mean, it, it's not The Godfather. Right? It's intense. The, the God, it's very intense. There's really, no, ro- there's nothing romantic. There's nothing romantic about, about City. There's of no God, candy right. coating or or right. chocolate covering no. to make it go down easier. No, I agree. Yeah, yeah. it's a difficult film to watch. Um, yeah, it's not in the same category as Scarface or Godfather in the sense of like, you know, it seems like, oh, I want to be a gangster there's some too. Fun, there's some fun to that. It's <laughs> right. not just so like right. utterly, you know, getting to the the, the most black hearted yeah. individuals and, and you know, it, profit and, and uh, violence above humanity. Yeah, and I think you, it's important for you to point out, and you do in your text, the, the humanity, the, the human rights catastrophe we have here. And uh, I know it's... Um, it's sad to think about, but it's the the reality. I mean, possibly I don't know over a million casualties. The 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 drug war. Well, he is said going we, on. he said we're over two hundred thousand with just in the last yeah what, yeah, 10 years. yeah yeah it's a real human I mean, rights I mean, catastrophe. 
in Mexico, in Latin America, you've got more than two million homicides. Or two million. In the last, in the last two decades, in Me- just in Mexico, it's two hundred thousand. Right. The whole of Latin America, more than two million. Not all, not all cartel related, but two million homicides overall. I mean, it's bigger. But you know, whereas a lot of the world got less violent, Latin America got more violent. Uh, but going back to some of the TV and film references, I mean, I, I loved. I mean, I, sometimes because the Mexican stuff is so intense, because I've covered it, uh, and I also have lost friends uh, in, in this uh, violence here. Then I find it hard as well to watch some of the the, the, the depictions because uh, I'm too emotionally close. Now you could say that you know I love watching Vietnam War films, and you might be somebody from Vietnam who's like you know I can't watch Vietnam, I can't watch like Platoon or Apocalypse Now. You know I can't you know go to, you know um, you know we saw you know crazy stuff. But I, I, I enjoyed and I, and I grew up watching you know the American uh, stuff and still still liked. It. I mean Goodfellas is one of my favorite movies of all time as well. I mean, I think that's out of this world. It's the perfect and the film. The Wire. Oh, The um, Wire was yeah, great. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the Wire now, the, is great. Uh, now, when I did the work for Blood Gun Money in Baltimore, Maryland, um, I hooked up with a a guy who was uh, did security, including he did security on The Wire among things, but he was a bouncer basically, and he was the guy who could introduce me to uh, drug traffickers and gun traffickers. And what one of the first people he introduced me to was he said, "We're going to go and meet um, Mr. Barksdale." Yeah, and I was like, and I was like, Mr. Barksdale, you know, you, you, you know, you, you, you're having fun. I mean, Mr. Bodie, Bar- Bodie Bar- you met Bodie Barksdale. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. so we, we went there and we met. Um, Bodie was the guy's uncle. I met the uh, the guy Dante, who in the film is called D'Angelo. Right, and so we he met ju- him. He just died. Just, just got killed. Just got, yeah, just got shot dead. So this is going back a couple of years. I met him in the city. We talked to him. He told me then he was writing a book. Now he got killed. Right as his book came out, I don't know if that was because he was just naming names in the book. They were angry that he was coming out with these stories. But then they they already made you know. And, and I was talking to him, and he said, and he said, yeah, that they they killed my, they killed me in the second series, you know, second season of uh, of, of things. So yeah, that's again bizarre stuff of uh, of kind of reality. And, and the wire is kind of such a reference point for the stuff in Baltimore, isn't it? And it was, a, I've done a lot of uh, reporting on this and, and writing. It was pretty much all a true story. And, and they were, even though they were, the, the show was taking place in the 2000s, um, they were dramatizing stuff that had all happened in the 80s under little Melvin Williams, who was the real Avon Barksdale. And then uh, Bodie Barksdale, they, they, they named a character Bodie in the, uh, I think it was Bodie Brodus in the, in the show. Yeah, there seemed to be a lot of authenticity. Yeah. That was well researched. The, the- but Bodie Barksdale was was a was serious as cancer, man. He, he was <laughs> he was uh, Little Melvin's top uh, enforcer, and a guy had a lot of bodies. In Baltimore, uh, one of the lawyers for El Chapo, a guy called William Purpura, or William Purpura, another uh, Italian uh, paisan. Um, <laughs> yeah, another of the uh, the lawyers of El Chapo was actually a Baltimore-based lawyer. And he'd, he'd represented loads of these guys. Uh, and a guy uh, from, the, uh, from the 80s called Rudy Williams, I believe, is that the name? Um, who was like, apparently, sounds quite a similar um, story to the, like, the American kingpin. He was apparently br- bringing in uh, heroin from Asia back then and, and is still doing time. Uh, but yeah, it was a kind you of interesting link is? between I believe Baltimore. Was, wasn't, was Rudy in L.A.? Or Rudy was a Baltimore guy. Yeah, the the name uh, uh, it comes out. I think it was, I think it was a Rudy, but it, maybe there's okay. two Rudys there. So we um, we really appreciate your time. And uh, this was amazing. So thank you so much for coming on. And so just tell our audience members how can they find out more about your work and about your books and and uh, other other appearances. Yeah, sure. So uh, uh, you can see some of my stuff on uh, www yoangrillo.com that's i-o-a-n g-r-i-l-l-o got all the links the stuff anyone you know please uh find the book especially the new one uh blood gun uh blood gun money <laughs> what's, the, what's the the uh blood gun money um the new one just out or on a book called narco gangster warlords uh you can see other stuff i was on the joe rogan experience among other podcasts and you can see that in uh now on spotify we moved to spotify uh the uh 
the, uh, the the Joe Rogan experience stuff. Yeah, we're hoping that your appearance here will generate the same kind of <laughs> kind of excitement, <laughs> excitement yeah, yeah, as yeah. your Joe Rogan ex- appearance. <laughs> Absolutely, and, uh, and I have stories. I have stories in the New York Times. Uh, I have stories in um, you know, I still keep on bang out regular media stuff as well. Okay, well, thank you again. I just want to remind our audience members that like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. We're going to have a YouTube presence soon, so by the time you're listening to this episode, this video should actually be up as well. So make sure you support us on social media. That helps us you know, continue to, to put out great content, get great guests. And thanks for everyone for listening. And you stay safe, man. He's in Mexico City. Yoan Grillo is in uh, Mexico City. So, so be safe. And I hope you'll come on the show again, and we really appreciate your time. Keep fighting the good fight, man. You do an amazing job. You're a, 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 just a fantastic journalist that uh, is an inspiration for someone like myself. Great. It'd be great to be up uh, next time when the pandemic's all over up in the, uh, up in, in the studio in, uh, in, uh, in Michigan. Yeah? Detroit. Detroit. Detroit, yeah. Detroit, baby.